Hi, my name is Anne McElhenney. And my name is Phil McElhenney. And welcome to the Anne and Phil Scoop. Yes. And it is 2024. That's going to take a while to get used to. We're actually taping this in advance of 2024, but we recorded this show earlier so that we could take a little break. But we obviously didn't want to leave you bereft of our fabulous company, fabulous company. during this long extended break. Right. You'd, be, um, you'd be just, I know you'd be bereft. 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 You wouldn't know what to do it's with yourself. Great word bereft. Isn't I it? like the word bereft. Yes. I had some other, there was some other word in the show notes and I changed it and put in the word bereft. It just, yes. it just feels like what people would feel if they were deprived of our company for too long, Phil. That's right. Yes. So, yes. Yes. So it's 2024. So what we're going to do today Happy is. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah, happy New Year, by the way, 2024. Have you kept your New Year's resolution? We're going to talk about New Year's resolutions at the end of the show, oh. by the way. Yes, yes. and uh, But we thought what we'd do today was have a little recap of 2023. And one of the big things was that in 2023, it was the 10-year anniversary since Gosnell was put away for basically ever. Yes. Um, Kermit Gosnell, let's remind you, uh, for those who don't know, he was the abortion doctor in Philadelphia who killed thousands of babies born alive and at least two women at his Philadelphia clinic. Who uh, are wor worth mentioning, by the way, Karnamaya Monger and Samika Shaw, both who died as a result of injuries they sustained being treated um, <laughs> by Kermit Gosnell having abortions in that clinic and, and did not make it out alive, basically. You'll remember Gosnell really, really became prominent when the mainstream media refused to cover his trial. And that was back when you could uh, shame the mainstream media. Uh, into doing things, that's into right. Into doing things. Now they, now they won't do it. Um, but uh, back and By then, the way, Molly Hemingway, very much um, the person who did a lot of the shaming back yes. then. She wrote on Twitter and she questioned many of the mainstream media, including people from the Washington Post. Sarah Cliff, in fact, from the Washington Post, who had described the Gosnell case as a local crime story. So when she was called out by like Molly... Like George Floyd, you mean? Yeah, exactly the same. Exactly. Like so George didn't, Floyd. Didn't cover that. Uh, like, Triv, like Trayvon Martin, you know, like any of those local crime stories which became yes. international news and those names are known and just actually when you say George Floyd reminds me to mention this which I think is worth mentioning the Irish Parliament um, had a moment a minute's silence on the death of George Floyd um, yeah they did, they not, did have, not have a yes go on Phil they did not have a minute's silence for the death of 1200 Israelis no funny that innocent Israelis yeah so for people who are writing and saying that Ireland is not even slightly anti-Semitic, um, mm, I would beg to differ. Can I just say, when I said innocent there, some people might go, well, George Floyd was innocent. George Floyd was actually uh, passing off forged um, notes at the time. That's why he was arrested. Uh, George Floyd had fentanyl in the system, which is an illegal drug. So I'm just making that distinction. A little bit of context that's yes. maybe necessary because everyone's yes. into context. A lot of people are into context now. It's funny. Oh. The left, well, no, actually, it's worth mentioning, actually, because I, I, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. The left created a word, a new word, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago called whataboutism. Mm. Whataboutism as a way to denigrate anybody talking about context. They were like, mm. what about ism? Well, gosh, I'll tell you one thing. The president of Harvard's very interested in the word context now, as are the presidents of MIT and the presidents of Penn. Former, Penn, former. former, okay, former president of Penn, who's now gone, Penn University. Anyway, as we went back, Phil, I'm keeping focus well, I here. I want to know, where, 10 years ago, 10 where years did the ago. the president of Harvard, where did she plagiarize the word context from? <sighs> That's Why right. you, did you notice they were all plagiarizing each other in the answers? That's well, that was just a learned, a learned rote thing. Right. So 2023, yes. 10 year anniversary of the conviction Gosnell. of Kermit Gosnell, the abortion doctor. Yeah, so during the week, we spoke to one of the uh, detectives who really the, the, the hero who, who, who brought Gosnell down, Detective Jim Wood. Uh, you can hear his voice on the Serial Killer podcast. And to go there, go to Serial Killer podcast pod.com um, it's the, the podcast is called Serial Killer a True Crime Podcast it's how Kermit Gosnell was brought down I was just looking at the comments the other day people are still watching it people are still listening to it it's become one of our most enduring and most popular uh, products. And by uh, the way, for those of you who don't maybe listen to narrative podcasts, I mean, the great thing about podcasts is that they're cheaper, you know, they're quite 
quite um, economical to make from a production point of view, even though obviously we have very high production values on our podcast, so they're more expensive, but they are enduring. So they're there forever. It's like a, mm-hmm. it's like this piece of history that's forever available. And so people are still accidentally coming across the Gothel yes. story, which is a great idea because people... Um, People can learn something that true people come to the abortion story through a true crime podcast yes. and they get an education that they hadn't asked for and it forever changes them. So let's listen to a little bit of the interview we did with Jim Wood this year talking about Kermit Gosnell. But again, w- walking through that door, what was the first thing that hit you? The smell. It was a hard smell of death, um, a mixture of chemicals. Um, it just so hard to describe because there was it was just um a horrible smell and uh, this is and, and again i just want to point out to people like this is coming from you 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 know it's not your first murder scene by the way it's not your first crime scene um you know you've been around so you know and i think i we know from all the people we've interviewed not just you but also you know all the other people who were on that raid um, who basically all talked about the smell that well, it was, it was completely? Who was it? Somebody said they had special Gosnell clothes that that oh. were that they would burn when they would come. I think it was Christine. Christine. She, she, and she, I think, she, and she, also she, Joanne Pescatore. Yeah, they, they would burn their clothes because you just couldn't get the smell out of it. Yeah. Um, I, and th- that's a good point because I think one of the most genius moves in the trial, and Phelan, you were there to see it. They brought in the equipment. And I, when I was in the courtroom myself, I could smell that smell emanating from the equipment. So I'm sure the jurors probably smelled it as well. Uh, it, it, it was just a pungent, foul odor, um, just an odor of death. You know, um, we love I'm Jim. Just looking Jim, actually, by the way, very dear friend of ours. We also made, by the way, well, just on the Gosnell point, just to say this point, we made, we made a movie, we wrote a book, we produced a play, and we made a podcast. One thing I want to say, I, I'm just looking at the podcast here. You can get it on, on Apple. I mean, people are still listening to the Glares December 6th. To, loved listening to this show. I've been telling friends and family too. Um, you know, now, people have been giving it one star reviews and actually the, the previous person talked about this. Seeing people give this one star review angers me. The quality of the reporting, interviews, narration and timeline events of events and evidence in this podcast is excellent. Due to the nature of the crime, I agree this story is hard to listen to, and it is hard to listen to at, at stages. At times. Um, but those who rated a one star missed the entire point of the podcast. Although this is connected to a political issue, the person charged was not investigated or charged because it was related to the, to abortion. The crimes came to light because of a drug bust, and all the jurors were pro-life. I mean... The, the, the pro, re- sorry, all the jurors were pro, pro, pro-abortion. Pro pro-abortion. So I also want to just mention something there because film is, and we're just going to put up a screen grab actually there of the ratings for the Serial Killer podcast and mm-hmm. people can see that if you're watching. So most people, huge number of people gave us a five-star rating. Yes. However, there are these there's a little, little, small, but significant number of people who gave a one star rating. Yes. But I think what's really worth pointing out here is those people who gave the one star rating, very, very interesting because we've read it in the reviews. They write and say, I listened to five, four episodes. I had written, listened to four episodes. I had written, listened to five episodes before I realised these people are pro-life. And what happened was they were really angry They weren't, they're not at all critical. You would not listen, by the way, trust me, we listen to a lot of podcasts. No one would listen to four episodes of a podcast that wasn't any good. So they loved the podcast until they realised what what What, it actually was telling them about abortion. And they didn't like it and didn't know how to process it. What they decided to do was make a protest and give a one star rating to try to hurt us. So, by the way, there's something that you can do. For New New Year's resolution. You know, is go on and give us a five star rating for the podcast because it makes a huge difference. But it is very interesting. Look at the comments and look at people who are angry and they're angry not because they think the podcast wasn't good. They're angry because they've been asked and forced to confront their attitude to abortion. So who else? Uh, we, We talked. Okay, so we had one thing that we had was the crime scene photographs uh, that we felt also told a story, turn a jur- turn, told a journalistic story of the degradation of the clinic, of the dirt, of the filth, of the cats, uh, of, of how his home looked like a hoarder's paradise, how the money, he had $275,000, how he was selling drugs. Uh, he had to, that money in cash. So we decided the thing to do was to have a, um, a photo exhibition. And, uh, you know, 
a crime, a true crime photo exhibition. And we had it in Ohio before uh, Columbus, Ohio, before Ohio voted on abortion for in, in the referendum and had the, the initiative. Um, let's just put up uh, a little video now to show par- what the exhibition looked like and some of the reactions. We are on 1241 North High Street, Columbus, Ohio, for evidence, crime scene photos from the trial of America's biggest serial killer, which is a photographic exhibition about the life and crimes of Kermit Gosnell, the abortion doctor. They're photographs of his crimes, but they're not political. Uh, He was an abortion doctor, uh, but he was convicted of murdering babies and killing his patients, several women patients. Killed. In a 30-year killing spree, he may have killed hundreds, the grand jury said maybe thousands. These photographs are evidence. They were taken by law enforcement officers for a court case. So that's why you're looking at actual, the truth here. Uh, they're unimpeachable. What do you think? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. I didn't know what to expect. I'm post border, so I'm not going in the room with the curtains. But right. The rest of it is amazing. Oh, they look very impactful. Yeah. I just like how the images expose like what the truth is when it comes to like abortions and everything. So it's like you know what you're signing up for. Especially the first round, it was like you know kind of like real effective. And, yeah. I think it's wise. I think I was the one that told you I took my daughter to see Gosnell when it first came out. Yes. But she would not. She didn't want to see the baby. Put the picture of the baby boy. Yeah. Um, afterwards, I pulled it out. I said, "You want to see?" She's like, "No." She will be seeing. It. <laughs> yeah. I saw you looking behind the curtain there. Um, what did you think of the images behind the curtain? Shows it for what it really is. Yeah. Disturbing. How evil somebody can be. It's just shocking. This is our medical system. No. Ohio went on then to enshrine abortion into its constitution. Um, and that's interesting. I, and I think it's our, our exhibition came quite late to Ohio. Um, and anyone who went in thought again about it, uh, really appreciated what the truth it was told. And by the way, the reason we wanted the photographic exhibition there was because the, uh, these were photographs taken by disinterested, dispassionate police photographers. They weren't and, pro-life and, they medi- weren't, and medical examiners. And medical examiners. These documents were. These photographs were accepted by the defence. They were accepted by the prosecution as factual. They were accepted by the judge as factual. They were accepted by the court as factual. So, so they're, they're unimpeachable. Unimpeachable. So anyway, when we. Um, after the we the person who opened the exhibition was Pastor Brian Williams of Columbus, Ohio. After the defeat in Ohio, after Ohio decided to enshrine the right to abortion in its constitution, we spoke to Pastor Brian uh, about what this meant for Ohio and what does it mean for other states. So, Pastor Brian, what advice would you give to the states that are facing these ballot measures in 2024? We think there's about six or seven states so far that are that are proposing to have abortion ballot initiatives. What, what advice would you give to them now, early in November of 2023? I would say get started as soon as possible with a life message and campaign. Have the people in position of authority, the government officials and community leaders get rally as much early support as possible uh, before the ad campaigns kick in and the propaganda machine gets turning. And I think, again, if we could have probably got started a lot sooner in Ohio, I think we could have maybe seen a different turnout, but I think another practical factor here is voter turnout. Um, I don't know what the final election result numbers are. I haven't checked this morning, but we had, I looked last night, roughly 8 million eligible voters in Ohio, and I think less than 50% turned out to vote. So Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a demographic issue where we have to get where are these unengaged voters um, and get them to the polls. And I think, again, it's just it's one of those things where the graphic nature of what we're actually talking about here has to be uncensored. So whether it's through visual aids such as the Gosnell exhibit or if it's just medical professionals graphically describing what are you actually doing? This is not they try to make it seem like it's just a typical medical procedure or reproductive health care. And they're literally suctioning the brain of a baby out through a tube, a vacuum tube, 
injecting it with saline solution. I mean, this is a, these are graphic things that are murderous and it just has to be shared. I mean, so I, I would appeal to people of courage to speak out and to make your voice heard and don't wait till six weeks before the election to do it. Get started as soon as, I mean, as soon as January comes, commit your year to it. So yeah, as you, as you hear there from Pastor Brian, you know, start work early and often. And, uh, you know, really, he, he's saying maybe they came in too late. So very interesting. We think we will be bringing the exhibition on the road. Uh, we're going to look at that as a, as a possibility for but 2024. But, but we also talked um, during the year and when we were organizing the, we also talked to Robin Perucci, a neonatologist, um, who we asked her to look at the photographs and to give her opinion about um, about them and particularly you know there are there are th one of the things we did by the way so some of the photographs were taken from the medical examiner's office and are of the babies that were recovered uh, the night of the raid when the police um, and the DA's office and the DEA mm -hmm. and the F FBI raided the clinic they found the bodies of 47 babies there and those bodies those 47 little bodies were taken to the medical examiner's office and they were photographed with high high definition again as Phelan said these are unimpeachable evidence of the truth the, the true face of abortion in the united states of america no one you know um people may say an awful lot about gosnell about you know horrific and all this kind of thing and it's out of, you know very uh, you know out of the blue and all very unusual that, whatever that's fine no one's suggesting that the people who went there were unusual However, no one's no one's suggesting that. No one said anything. No no one's criticizing the people who went there. And the people who went there were five, six, seven, eight months pregnant. This happens. It happens in America and in many parts of America it's legal. So yeah. those photographs those photographs then are very, very um educational. Mm -hmm. And what we did, by the way, because obviously the sensitivity about them, we in the exhibition, as you probably just saw in the clip, they were put behind a uh, curtain. Put behind a curtain. But I asked um, Robin Perucci, Dr. Robin Perucci, um, a neonatologist, to talk to me about the photographs that she saw. Let's let's have a listen to to that interview. I'm going to move on now to the next set of six photographs. Now these photographs are you'll see these red bags. This is where Gosnell stored the remains of babies that had been aborted um, and I think in a couple of cases some of the bodies that were recovered were were in fact murdered um, in the technical in the technical phrase um, there are photographs here that show just the bags just all of the bags and also then we can see a fridge and we can see a freezer with these containers inside those containers were the bodies of babies how are the babies remains so sometimes you don't have a great outcome in the neonatal unit and sometimes you obviously have have children who don't make it how do you treat the remains because this is a very particular um this is what gosnell did he threw them into these red bags he put them into the freezer he threw them into the fridge um he in some cases put them down um the the sink in fact um, we know that because the drains were clogged up what how are the remains of babies in your clinic uh, treated okay to have actual children in random containers and containers is an overstatement he's cut up part bottom parts of of just random plastic containers like household goods uh, okay if i was speechless before what the premises look like i don't even know what to do with this um when we have the unfortunate experience of a little one passes, our nursing staff finds the most beautiful outfits to put the babies in. And we bring them tenderly wrapped in the softest blankets and the most beautiful clothing. People have to donate to be held by their parents and lovingly touched and, and bathed and cleaned and just um, held to people's hearts. So to, for any human being to be discarded 
and left like this. Um, I, I, it doesn't make sense. This is not how we treat each other. So I think what's what's powerful about that is how babies of that very same age are treated in a context of a hospital by any neonatologist like herself yes, yes. and the contrast with how these children ended up. Well, actually, that, that, that reminds me of of, um, of a doctor we know who's pro-life. And we said, how, why are you pro-life? And yes. he says, well, when I was, when I was a resident, you know, yep. I, I, there was the abortions were being done here and then down the corridor, they were uh, spending a million dollars to save a baby at the same age, you know, save a 24. We were doing abortions up there at 24 weeks and they were doing... Uh, saving babies who would be born prematurely at 24 weeks. And I was thinking, this this doesn't doesn't make logical sense, doesn't make moral sense. So, you know, and I think that's really what, what Dr. Perucci was saying there as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So another thing that happened, obviously, we've had a number of, you know, I know a lot of you really love films, confrontations with people. And we had a few. I, I, I know, the, a, I know in the show notes, can I just object here? I know in the show notes, uh, someone has referred to as films, confrontations. I think it's films, excellent journalistic adventures. How about that? Something which can like... end up as confrontation. The only confrontation is because the person wouldn't talk to me. This is blaming the victim. That's right. Or something. Poor film. So one of the first um, moments of con- a c- encounter that the journalist Phelan <laughs> McAleer had <laughs> that this ended, year. That ended in a confrontation. Was with the our very much loved Patrice Collars, the BLM, the founder of Black Lives Matter, um, who, as you probably know, was this year exposed as a massive fraud yes. who had um, extorted yeah. massive funds from the Bl- Black Lives Matter movement and yes. um, to give money to her boyfriend and to buy lots of nice properties. And her brother. Yeah, she, she bought a, a slew of houses. She gave about a million dollars to her boyfriend and her brother. Nice work if you get it. So here's me asking some journalistic questions um, uh, as she was uh, giving a speech at a museum in Los Angeles. Here we go. Miss Colors, I wanted to ask you, do you think it's appropriate that you give your boyfriend uh, almost a million dollars of BLM money? Do you not think it's inappropriate, it's unethical to give a million dollars and 840,000 to your brother? Would you prepare to answer the question? Do you think it's appropriate? Do you think it's appropriate? Do you think it's appropriate? Why won't you answer the question? 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 Answer I'm the being question? harassed right now, you guys. Why won't you answer the question? I'm being harassed. You gave right a million now. dollars of charitable money. Don't keep your hands off me. Keep your hands off me. You give a million dollars of charitable money. You give us a million dollars of charitable money. So you gotta leave. So you gotta leave. No, you gotta leave. They said you can ask questions. They said you can ask questions. I'm asking questions. Come on, you gotta go, sir. I'm on, asking no, questions. No, no, we're asking you to leave. You're asking me to leave. We've asked you for three okay. times to leave. Kieran. Kieran, okay, Kieran, I'm leaving now. Okay, okay. let's go. Let's go. No, I think Patrice does not really want to talk film to you. Shockingly, shockingly. Yes. And I know people love talking to you. Over the summer, and you'll see, uh, I'm going, we're going to come on to my interview with James O'Keefe uh, later in the show. But after we did this interview with James O'Keefe, we all went for lunch together. And it was a long lunch, a lazy lunch. And uh, we, we, I looked around and suddenly we were the last people in the restaurant except I looked over and there it was a big restaurant to a massive restaurant in Venice, California and I was thinking that looks like Stephen Donziger the corrupt lawyer who's been disbarred in by two jurisdictions and who was on, uh, under house arrest for contempt of court uh, basically one of the biggest scammers in history he got, he got an award of 18 billion dollars against the Chevron oil company uh, for polluting the rainforest it was all a scam it never happened uh well, he got the the award, and it turned out when when they fought it that he had bribed a corrupt judge in Ecuador to uh, to have the judgment and ghost wrote the judgment himself, uh, and so he wrote his own judgment awarding himself. Uh, I think it was nine billion, and then the court of appeal uh, doubled it to eighteen billion. So, I. Uh, a bit of context here. I saw him looking at his phone, whatever. I thought, well, I'm a journalist and I'm here with James O'Keefe. I can't. We had this long and lengthy interview about how important it was to always be a journalist. And, you know, and actually, and it's very interesting what it takes to be a journalist. Always being on, always be, always doing it, always 
So I was, I was thinking, I have to go over and ask him these questions now. I didn't realize at this moment he was literally he had just got the news that his last appeal to the Supreme Court had been rejected. Uh, so he wasn't in a great mood. But I mean, ultimately, he's a thug underneath the lawyerly demeanor. So let's look at what happened. Stephen, Stephen, I, now you're disbarred. Uh, would you like to apologize for misleading people about you? Oh, oh. Get out of the way. Stephen, why would you ask a question? This guy Stephen. is assaulting and harassing. I'm not. I'm asking a question, Stephen. You're a lawyer. Uh, are you going to, Stephen, you're disbarred now. Are you going to apologize for uh, fraud, trying to defraud Chevron? Why did you object to the cleanup? Hey, stop. Give me my phone. Give me my phone. On the ground. Give me my phone. Pick it up and go. Where is it? Where is it? Here. Hey. Hey. Can you please call the police and get this man arrested? Hey. Let go of me. Let go of me. Let go of me. Let go of me. Let go of me, sir. Hey, hey, hey. Yes, that's so. Uh, Philem Yan, your phone was destroyed. I mean, yeah, yes. yeah, he was genuinely assaulted. I mean, what, a, what uh, as you say, very thuggish behaviour. Yeah. Um, but you know, it wasn't the only person that you tried to talk to. Philem, rather well, significant yes, it, person. We, also, Philem had um tried to speak to Hunter Biden, right, Philem? Yes, yes. Well, I I wrote to him often. I yeah. asked him questions. I knocked on his door. Um, and you know, we we talked about this the last time. Uh. You know, he claimed in his uh, in a recent interview that we harassed him 24 seven. We put a van. We didn't do any of that. We didn't do any of that. We put, we had a van outside his house with with questions on it for a few hours. A Tuesday afternoon, we called to his house. I, I wrote multiple emails, but we called to his house uh, to ask questions. And when he wouldn't answer any questions, I felt it was important to go around on the canals uh, in a canoe, in a canoe. If you listen to that interview he gave with Moby uh, it was it was very much along the lines of I was clean I was enjoying feeding the ducks with my son I was harassed by these uh, nut jobs and and the reality is uh, in the recent indictment he was clean he says from May 2019 the indictment for tax evasion points out that he received 1.2 million uh, from a friend, Kevin Morris, uh, the, the the faker himself, the fake lawyer, or the fake documentary. The lawyer who infiltrated our set That's when right. we were in Serbia shooting the movie, and then pretended to be a documentary filmmaker. And then he uh, he also got one hundred and forty nine thousand uh, in an advance for his fake memoir, fake tell all memoir, and he got that siphoned off into his wife's bank account. So. Actually, the questions I was asking him on the canoe, the questions I was asking him by email, the questions we were asking him on the side of the van have since proven to be very, very valid journalistic questions. And if he'd answered them then, well, then that would have been a very, very interesting story. He didn't. So let me let's look at me asking some questions in my as he, as he called it a canoe. It's actually a kayak. So let's go. Mr. Biden, I see you pull the curtains now. You can come out, please. He's at the window. He's at the window. Beware of the window. Let's come on. Let's talk. Hello. Hello. I'm looking for Hunter. Uh, we're looking for Mr. Biden. Uh, I'm here to ask him some questions. I'm a journalist. Uh, who, who are you, sir? I'm a, I work with the Secret Service. Okay. Yeah, we're not going to be taking any questions. Well, I'm not asking you questions. Okay. I, I want to ask Mr. Biden. Well, he's, he's not, not going to take any business. He's not going to come down. So. He's, a, he's, a, he's promoting a book at the moment. Uh, oh, I understand that. Yeah, so I just, I'm going to no, just... No, no, we're not going to hit this anymore. Okay, that's fine. We're just going to... You can stay here as long as you want, uh, but we're not going to ask him any questions. No, no, I'm, I'm good. And we're I'm not going to touch anything, okay? Okay, that's Thank fine. You. I understand right. that. Thank you very much. All right, no problem. All the best. All right, take care. Do you think it's appropriate that the President of the United States got 10% of your earnings from foreign entities? We just want to know, is Joe Biden the big guy? Is Joe Biden the big guy? And just when you said uh, earlier there, Philip, about his fake memoir, I mean, you know, just one instance of the fakery of his memoir, yes. you know, is he um, 
you know, he claims in the book, he mentions in the book, you know, that woman from Arkansas. So this, you know, that woman, like yes. he can't remember her name. So this is the woman who gave birth. Doesn't really remember anything about it. Who gave birth to his his son, to Hunter Biden's son. Um, that daughter. that daughter, oh, sorry, give birth to his, the daughter. Uh, Nancy, no. London. Navy, London. London is the is the mother and Navy is and the Navy, daughter. And Navy remember? Roberts, Navy Roberts is the daughter. And what's, What's what's very interesting about that is he couldn't remember the name. That's kind of odd, by the way, because the truth is that the mother of the child, the mother of that wee girl, was on the payroll, was on the payroll for a year of his company. Of his company, and he didn't, you know, it wasn't like he employed a thousand people, by the way. And obviously, she was on the payroll, and she wasn't really, you know, working as in a capacity as a secretary or anything like that. So this was actually, you know, very well organized and, you know, some kind of manipulation of the, of, tax, of, system. Of the tax system, actually, of a way of getting siphoning off money to her. But to, to say that, you know, that woman from Arkansas, basically, he couldn't really remember her name. He knew exactly that's who she lie. was. A total lie. And it just comes, it just, you know, that's why. The lies come it. mighty easy. You know, he calls it a confessional book. It's not a confessional book. He just can't help himself but lie all the time. And the idea, for example, I mean, I always point this out, that that, en- that he was of any value to an energy company in Ukraine, the Burisma company, where he was getting $83,000 a month for five years. This is nonsense because according to himself in that book, he was basically getting high every 20 minutes. Yeah. So we made the My Son Hunter movie, by the way, and we, as you know, in 2022, it came out in 2022, but we released it in 2023, last year, we released the movie for free. If you haven't seen it, or if you've got a friend who hasn't seen it, you want to send them over to watch it right now, and they can get it at, all you've got to do is put in mysonhunter.com. No, no, My Son Hunter Hunter movie. Sorry, excuse me, you're right. mysonhuntermovie.com, mysonhuntermovie.com. But let's play the trailer now. Let's Let's play the trailer. So I'll tell you what's going down. You know who I am. They told me you were VIP, well connected to the government. What kind of a moron forgets to pick up his laptop at a repair shop? You're a Biden. Act like one. Everything he built, life, I just ruined it all. I want to know everything that's on that laptop that can ruin my erection. My friends, it's time to party! I'm an artist. Tell me how I can help you. Well, I don't deserve help. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've been through worse. You're the smartest man I know. Thanks, Dad. I just wish I could speak some sense to you. I'll never forget Cory Bob. He was a bad dude. No joke. Dad, we were talking about suffering. No. I can't seem to find anything but positive stuff on the Bidens. Who's the point man for the foreign policy in the Obama regime? Joe Biden. So it looks like you need a billion dollars. So the obvious next question is, where's Hunter? I can remember getting paid some money, but I can't remember what for. Well, my dad says, we never discuss my businesses, period. Or my cut. What's happening in there? Joe's in on it. Party's over! (laughs) You had everything, Hunter, and you threw it all away. You hope the laptop will take down everybody with you. Get out! China's not our enemy. They're not bad folks, folks. I love my dad, and I just want to make him proud. I am the one who brings in all the deals. I am the one. The boy. Yeah. Also, remember, we we tried to get it shown in Congress. And of course, Congress uh, closed it down because, um, you know, the, the again, this is what Democrats do. They, they use obscure laws or fake laws or fake rules and then break the rules when they want to. It won't go to the, it's just, look, go watch the movie, mysonhundredmovie.com. Send it to all your friends. Let's get this story out here because the more the movie is 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 watched, the more obvious uh, it is a documentary, not yes, a movie. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but exactly. it's actually a movie movie with the great Lawrence Fox in it, directed by Robert Davi, written by Brian Godawa. Um It's 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 a lot of fun. Gina Carano's in it as well. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun. A lot a great movie. 
Um, what else happened? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, so let's talk about James O'Keefe. Um, yeah, you mentioned James O'Keefe earlier, and obviously James O'Keefe, you know, um, was ousted from Project Veritas, the organisation that he started. And basically, you know, there is no there is no Project Veritas yeah, without I'm, James. I'm unclear. Well, I'm, I think it's has it gone completely now, or is it still limping along? That's not an insult to the people who took over Project Veritas after he left. Good journalism is a rare thing. Good journalism is instinctual. It's learned. Uh, good journalism is tough. It's a slog. Uh, especially the journalism, funny, that James want people to do because it's a tough, a slog. It's very stressful. And you don't get any byline, any credit for it because you're, you're, you're undercover and you want to go back undercover. It's tough to get people to do that. Um, we had the privilege to sit down uh, with with James uh, after uh, after the board fired him and just as he was setting up his new organization OMG Media O'Keefe Media Group um and uh, I, I I was looking about it and I was thinking what 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 excerpt will I pull I mean the the go and wa- go and listen we'll put the the link to the interview in the show notes but go and watch the full interview it's a great it's a great uh, analysis of journalism. What makes great journalism? I, I wanted. I thought you know it's New Year and we'll do something lighter and, and fun. Uh, so I wanted to do, to bring you back to the part where I, James and I discuss our mutual connection to Andrew Breitbart. Oh. Uh, we both met Andrew around the same time, about fifteen years ago, um, and I remember Andrew telling me about uh, launching, planning to launch. Breitbart, which was then the big sites, and then James came in with his story shortly after that. So let's, and that was the Acorn story. That was bringing down the the Democrat wow. corrupt media organization, the corrupt or Acorn organization. So let's have James and I discuss the Acorn story. You, you'll you'll enjoy this. Remind people about the Acorn story. What was it? And try and tell them how big it was. That was almost 15 years ago. Wow. Uh, September 2009. Uh, this was a story, undercover tapes of mm. people inside this group called ACORN, which was uh, the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now. And they were telling me how to evade uh, tax laws and circumvent tax laws and declare the prostitution money because I was pretending to be a, a, a pimp. Mm-hmm. Uh and to disguise this on my income taxes. And this was a massive story. It was covered by the mainstream media. It led to congressional action to defund yeah. ACORN. And it, the John Stewart covered it on The Daily yeah. Show. South Park covered it. It was a it was a massive story and it all happened in about a week's time. That's right. Yeah, so ACORN, uh, and they were heavily involved in, in Obama's election. They were right in there in the in the Democratic establishment. And I mean, you said a couple of interesting things there. It was covered by the mainstream media. And I think so many of your current issues are very, you can almost take what happened with ACORN and say, if only they, if only people understood what happened with ACORN. Andrew Breitbart had maybe, what was it, four or five, or sorry, you guys had four or five different Acorn outlets Mm -hmm. telling you this. And some of them were worse than others. Some of them, I mean, I remember one of them, you said, we're bringing in a couple of 14-year-olds. Yes. And rather than reporting you for sex trafficking, they told you that you could put them down as as, uh, dependents. Dependent minors and get a tax deduction on them. (laughs) Yes. You know, so, but Andrew was clever and Andrew... Andrew understand, and I remember saying, it's nothing, him saying, we have to get the mainstream media involved in these things. Mm-hmm. They, they have to cover it. And, and I think you've said that in the past too. And he, the drip, drip of these stories was the killer. If you'd released them all at once, they could have killed the story in a day or two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, don't fire all your ammunition at once. Um, and he had said that, you know, if we release these a little bit of time, they'll say that it's isolated. They fell into that trap. Uh-huh. CNN reported, well, this is just an isolated incident. Of course, they had no, they had no, there was no way for them to know yes. that it was isolated, but they just jumped to that conclusion, mm-hmm. showcasing the, uh, the, the avarice, the 
collusion, uh, the collusion, and the you know just not checking your facts. Yeah, and they did this. And Andrew told me, "Do not pick up your phone." One time, the the first day the story launched, someone called my iPhone. iPhones are brand new at that point. It was like they'd only been out a year. Someone called my iPhone seventy times. CNN producer, and I didn't pick up the phone. I couldn't actually make an outgoing call because the phone kept ringing. I couldn't actually type in. Yeah. And Andrew said, they're going to try to personalize the story. They're going to make it about you personally. So don't pick up the phone. So I didn't. And they were unable to personalize the story. Yeah. Sure. That, that, yeah interview with, fantastic. that interview with James lasted, and I was looking there, it lasted an hour and seven. It could have gone on for, yeah. It could have gone on for two hours. Yeah, Maybe exactly. it should have, you know. But yeah, I think yeah. James was just so busy at that time yeah. uh, fielding calls and fielding tip-offs and all that. So... But talking of delightful, um, we also brought you um, some delightful ex extracts from Mark Stein's deposition. Mark Stein, you'll remember, is facing a civil suit for defamation because over 10 years ago, in a column for the National Review, he said that the hysterical claims of climate scientist Michael Mann were based on bad data. In other words, the hockey stick was a fraud. That idea that the temperature is going to be was level until man arrived, you know, until the Industrial Revolution and America arrived. Um, and so, basically, you know, this so this so this happened. He wrote that article. I think it was now thirteen years ago. Yes. This litigation has gone on for thirteen years, as somebody said. You know, the the process is the is the punishment, um, and it has been postponed and changed, timed many many times. It was meant to happen in November. Now it's supposed to happen in January, and certainly we will be there. We mm. will be definitely be there in January to cover that trial. And it, you know, obviously, it looks like I think last time I checked, Mark Stein is probably going to be representing himself, which would be amazing. amazing. And just to give you a sense and a flavour of how, I mean, not that you need to be reminded of how brilliant Ma uh, Mark Stein is, but let's let's have a little, little listen to this. So this is, so he gave these depositions in advance of the, the court case. Um, They're on his site, a site, Stein Online. And you, uh, I mean, honestly, if you're looking for, click, if you're yeah. looking for something delightful to do over the holidays, yes. this is something really delightful to do. But let's, let's have, let's give you a little taste of exactly, you know, how extraordinary he is. And here he is uh, seriously explaining why he called Michael Mann an insecure, litigious dweep and yeah. a self-conferred Nobel laureate of the scanty, sloppy and shitty society. Yes. Let's have a listen to that. It's brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a listen to some of the names he was called. Uh, well, in your article, Super Villain, you do refer to Michael Mann as a litigious dweeb. Correct. And wh wh which article is this? Dr. Man, supervillain, Exhibit 45. Okay, 45. Oh, yeah, there we are. Um, yeah, I actually say an insecure litigious dweeb. Um, and I, 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 I think the insecurity, you know, his principal skills, uh, in, in whatever you call it down here, the rule of completion, I think we should note for the record that I say he's an insecure litigious dweeb whose principal skills are blocking, banning, and hysterically shrieking that Amazon.com cracked down on any reviewers insufficiently fawning in their reviews of his book. That's uh, what I said. Yeah, thank you. And you refer to him as a self-conferred Nobel laureate. And That's correct and a distinguished fellow of the scanty, sloppy, and sh society, right? Can I just say at the end of that, you know, when the lawyer says, and a distinguished fellow of the scanty, sloppy, and sh society, right? So that sounds terrible. And then you would think, well, you shouldn't be calling them that. But as Mark then points out, each one of those words, scanty, sloppy, and sh are hyperlinked. And they link to articles by other scientists. Yes. It's the other scientists yes. calling Michael Mann that. Yeah, so as Mark said, you know, for the first time in the history of the Nobel uh, oh, Committee. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. They had to issue a statement saying, saying yeah, we never gave you a prize, yeah, sir. Stop, stop saying, stop but saying. But he's still at it. He's still uh, introduced on, on, on the media as a Nobel laureate, and he never corrects them. So as I say, what is 2024 hold? We're going to do the Mark Stein trial. Uh, we're going to cover it in our inimitable way. As you know, we're working, we just returned from Israel. We're working hard on that project. You are going to love our Israel project. It's, it's, it's one of our... It's probably I one love, of the biggest things we've ever done. Uh, I'm very excited about it. We yeah. interviewed survivors and heroes, and we're going to make sure no one forgets their stories. Um, you know, it was, it was an amazing... Let, let's just play a little clip of that demonstration we went to. Uh, this is a counter demonstration to the, um, to the, to the pro 
Palestinian or whatever. They, I mean, this is this is an amazing thing about Israel. You can have uh, all the protests you want uh, in Israel, and you can even protest the government. You can protest the war. You can't protest the government in Ham in uh, Hamas controlled Gaza. Um, so 2024 is going to be an important year as an election. Let's There's have a look at that clip then. Oh, yeah. So 2024 is going to be a very important year. Obviously, the election is going to be massive and it's going to dominate everything for the year. Who knows what's going to yes. happen with Trump, with all this, um, you know, le, yeah. le, what do you call it? What do you call that? Lawfare. Law, 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 law lawfare that has been, uh, I mean, it's just an extraordinary thing that the that every branch of isn't, government, isn't, and I thought it was something, somebody said that the other day, like literally every branch of, gov of government, of the executive, yes. is has its sights on him and they're trying to take him down yeah, for, it's hilarious for everything. Because this is a man who was a public figure for 40 years and never faced legal jeopardy once. And then once he started taking on the establishment, suddenly he's a mass criminal. Yeah, yeah, exactly, you know? exactly. It's extraordinary. The abortion issue obviously will be huge as well in 2024. As we said before, there have now been seven ballot initiatives across the country. Each one of them was lost by the pro-life side. This year, in 2024, in November, there will be a bunch of these. Um, all these states all over the place are scrambling to get a ballot measure on the, um, you know, on front of the electorate. And of course, they're very emboldened. The pro-abortion side are very emboldened by the success they've had so far. And for those mm -hmm. of you trying to, you know, understand why they've been successful, because they've been successful even in very conservative places. And the reason is an extraordinary amount of money. I believe it's 2000 percent more money being spent on the pro-abortion mm -hmm. side than the pro-life side, P together with the collusion of the media in allowing the pro-abortion side to lie yep. and say things like women will die. And say things like, um, you know, ectopic pregnancy or miscarriage. You'll go to prison if you turn up, ha you know, having a miscarriage. This is these are lies. These are complete lies. Yeah. Or, or that, or that for the, or for the health of a woman, an abortion will save a woman's life. <clears throat> that is never ever the case. Mm -hmm. If there has to be a choice made, the child will be, the baby will be delivered. The baby does not need to be deliberate, deliberately killed. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we'll, obviously we're going to be dealing with that issue. And one of our thoughts is, and, and we're going to come to that in a moment, that you could help us, by the way. We would like to bring the exhibition all over the country and we would like to do it early and often. Yes. We also have the Israel Project, as Phelan mentioned earlier. We have the Mark Stein trial and we have Phelan. We're, yes, the we, filmed, we filmed the, um, the, the, the as we call it, the <coughs> trans play. So, yeah, we, we did a play in London, a, a stage reading of a court case in London. Hilarious. Um, uh, Hilari uh, sorry, hilarious and poignant and tragic and sad, sad and you know there were Makes, tears, uh, enough to yeah. make you angry. Tears of laughter, tears of anger. But what's very, very it's powerful. It's called Mermaids versus the Alliance. It's based on uh, what's really powerful it's, about it. It's basically it's basically the trans issue on trial, a little bit like the Mark Stein, where the Mark Stein case is the climate on trial. Mm -hmm. This is trans on trial with people unable to do electioneering or whatever. They have to answer questions, and when they have to answer direct questions about the trans issue, my God, does it sound ludicrous? So it's based on a court case. Uh, so yeah, so a mermaids, which is a a, a, a trans youth uh, charity, which is basically mutilate young people charity, they sued the charity commission in London, saying you can't allow these anti-trans people to have a charitable status, the LGB alliance. So for they, and I think they took on more than they than they thought they were taking on. So suddenly they found they wanted to sue the charity commission against LGB alliance. Suddenly. Trans activists were on trial, and that's what the court case turned into was, uh, you know, under the spotlight, answer these questions about your trans activism. And they had no, their ideology was skin deep, skin deep. There was nothing there when uh, when when they were asked. And 
we're going to expose that. So we're releasing that transplant. So next year is it's it's jam packed basically, um, and. By the way, you know, and we'll, we'll, we will do what we've always done, which is respond to news stories as they happen. And we have some New Year's resolutions, including the fact that I promised to bring back the recipe section. Obviously, we've been travelling. Of traveling, the podcast, yes. Of the podcast, we've been travelling an awful lot, so that made it very, very difficult. But um, for today, by the way, and for this week, just to remind people that it's still, you know, ho- sort of, it's still winter. And so I would recommend people to make... Mince. mince pies and for those of you in America obviously people in the UK and Ireland have no problem finding mince meat but by the way I found this mince meat I think we need made to. by made by Wilkin and Sons it's a UK one I got that I think in, in Gelson's obviously Gelson's very expensive but I also found this this stuff called none such mince meat and for those of you who don't know there's no meat in mince meat there is often in British mince meat in, in British mi- mince meat well actually in, in, in mince meat that's made into mince pies mm-hmm. what there is is and we're going to show the recipe in a moment What and it's very simple by the way because you buy the mince meat the, this mince meat there's no, min, there's, no, there's no meat in it it's actually raisins sultanas apples rum all kinds of gorgeous things like that and you put it into short crust pastry and it's yummy and you eat it with clotted cream and I would highly recommend it let's have a look at that recipe right now I want to talk about food now <laughs> because um, I should talk about food now but so here's the thing about uh, what we made yesterday yeah. so we made mince pies yesterday we made the mince pies together by the way and I, I'm all about cheating I think it's really important people are really busy and tired and I think cheating is fine with food so here's how you cheat this and it's so easy so first of all I didn't know I started making the mince pies and I was thinking I wonder can Americans buy mince meat so this is mince meat and we're showing it up. I think we'll, there'll be a better version of this uh, up on your screen. But basically, this is from uh, Cross and Blackwell. And I just checked it out. All, your, all the supermarkets in America sir, have this thing called mincemeat. By the way, for those of you who don't know, there's no meat in mincemeat. I'm shocked. There is no meat in mincemeat. I don't know why they called it that. Now, there is suet. So I think the reason that they might say that is I think that the fat is possibly animal fat. Anyway, it's basically um, nice a stuff. very heavy, nice stuff with loads and loads of fruit in it. What you do, and I've put up the recipe, it's super simple. You cut up an apple, you put an apple into some of this. I used a half of this jam jar yesterday and made, what did I make, like 10? Mm-hmm. Uh, I made like 10 uh, of these. And I bought the ready-made, ready-rolled pastry from Trader Joe's. And you know what? Yeah. Good luck to you if you want to make pastry. And it's great and it's lovely and all of that. Can I just say I, Trader Joe's is overrated. Okay, I'm moving on. Phelan has a thing with Trader Joe's, but I can tell you one thing. I was very impressed with their pastry. Did yes. you not think the pastry no, was great? No, the pastry was, uh, and I was heavily involved in the pastry. He was, uh, and we're going to put up a whole bunch of photographs of us making the pa- uh, ma- uh, making these mince pies yesterday. They came out of the oven. And by the way, you'll notice, and look at those photographs. They're not the prettiest, right? They're not perfect. But if you came for perfect cookery, this is not the place for it, right? It ain't always pretty, but it always tastes good, right? Like, uh, I think that's the trick, right? Mo- but here's what was incredible was, I said, let's just, ha- we were going out for a walk, let's just have one. So I had three, how many did you have? You had three in that one sitting. <clears throat> Yeah, that was one six. or two, how one many, or two. How many, and, then, and then he came back for more. And just and here's how you serve them. Serve them with like, you know, clotted cream, po- heavy pouring cream, or just vanilla ice cream. They are killer. And you know, the truth is, you can eat them cold. I think you can eat them cold. Yes, of course you can eat them let's cold. Let's talk about that. I'd prefer oh, no, to eat them warm. I like Why them cold. We, what have we got to talk so, about? We, so, you know, let's go into the more details. But are you going to put the recipe up? Or oh, no, the recipe's uh, going to go. Describe. It couldn't it be simpler? So you're just going to, well, you're just going to, what you do, with, by the way, you don't need a pastry cutter for this. Roll out your pastry, and instead of a pastry cutter, use a glass. You know, find a glass, different B- glass shapes. Big enough for the, for the pocket. The bottom, the bottom needs to be bigger than the top. So you yes. need a lid. You need a bottom. Bigger, big circle, the lid, smaller circle, yeah. and then you're going to spoon in like two, you know, don't so, overfill on. them. People, so you make the big one, you put it into the muffin tray and you, you, you fit it in. Phelan was very good at this And then yesterday. you spoon in not too much. Not too much, but like some of them, a little bit too some much. Some of them. And they will explode. Some of them spilled over. Some of them spilled over, but you know, spilled over in a gorgeous way. And then, then you, you have this caramelized put thing Put the lid on. on and do you, what do you? Remember sp- my word caramelized. Caramelized is another word for burnt. Yeah, go on ahead. And uh, you put the lid on. You put the lid on and the, you press lid, down. Lid pastry and you press you down. The, you press down, right, to make a seal. Some people will put a little rim of water to help with making the seal. And then I used an egg wash. You could me- use a milk wash either to just get a lovely sheen off the top. Then the 
other really important thing to do is to prick a hole, you know, not a hole, but just just prick with uh, with a knife, right. with a sharp knife, into the top of all so of them, don't so they don't explode, so that they have air to breathe. And then put them in. I we put at them the in top of the at oven. the top of the oven, four hundred. He preheat the oven to four hundred. Put them in for. Take them out and look at them at twenty minutes. And by the way, you know when people are not, you know, you know when I'm not a hundred percent saying, oh, exactly twenty minutes. It's because I don't know your oven, and you know your oven. If you've got a very fast oven, they'll probably be done in twenty minutes. Um, we were we were going more to like 25, 26, 27 minutes. But what you really want is the top to get a little bit browned, and you take them out. Don't eat them like instantly, but yes. you know it's very hard. We sort of did, but we didn't burn ourselves. Let them cool, right? cool down a bit. Let them cool down a bit. I took them outside and put them outside because the weather had improved a little bit here. Um, but we had them with the clotted. Cream. Crazy California. We should do a crazy California section. The weather's terrible. That's crazy. Weather's crazy California. I want my money back. I don't know why I'm paying the high taxes. It's 50 degrees today. Yes. What's, how did that happen? Yes. But I can tell you one thing. If you have never tried to make mince pies, do it. Do it, do it, do it. Do it with a suet. Do it, do it with a <laughs> suet. Oh, yeah. look at you, Phil. Um, and send us a photograph. I'd love to see a photograph of your mince pies. And send me any questions. If I've left something out in that, but I've got, the recipe is going to go up on the Facebook page. They're really, really yummy. They're a nice thing to bring if you're going over to somebody's house for a tree trimming. And they're British, in it. And what you could do is bring them over uncooked and put them into their oven, actually, so that you get them out of the oven um, nice and hot. You don't. I don't want to eat them cold. And by the way, can I just say, I have never made mince pies before, but they were a huge success, number one. And number two... I didn't like mince pies before, but I really liked these. Yeah, they were great. Really Love nice. Them. And I have to say, this particular mince meat, as they call it, mince meat, is pretty nice. Now, that could be because it's cr- there's it's rum and brandy in it. Well, you can Cross never go Blackwell, wrong, you know. It's Cross British and Blackwell, which is a very British name, by the way. But I, I chopped up a little uh, uh, apple in there because it just gave it a, just a little bit of different consistency with this with this mincemeat. So anyway, do it, do it, do it, do, do it, it with suet, do it with and uh, you'll love it. You really will love it. But try not to eat three of them in a row. Um, but they are fabulous. So. We highly recommend that you make mince pies and bring your friends around, even if they're not British, and introduce it, by the way, to your American friends who might be who might be a little bit shocked at the prospect. But you can have it with custard, with cream, with ice cream. Delightful. And have them directly out of the oven. Delightful. But you can also eat them cold. We want to thank everyone who donated so far this year and particularly yes. people who donated up at the, up to the end of the year. Yes. If you haven't had a chance to donate yet, please do donate. And all you've got to do is go to unreportedstoriesociety.com, unreportedstoriesociety.com and look on the right hand side up in the corner and there's a donate button. It couldn't be easier for you. Yes. Um, and please do that. And remember, all your donations are tax deductible. We need and appreciate your support. Um and please help us continue to do the things yes. that we do. And I know people, so many people write and thank us for what we do. Um, the best way to thank us really would be to help us keep going. Yes. We'd really appreciate it. But I want to end the podcast on a kind of a very happy, clappy note, which is to remind you that Top Cat and Scaredy Cat, who were abandoned a lot They've this year. They've been through a lot this year. They've had they a very last tough year, year. They were through a lot. They went through a lot. We're looking at photographs of them as we speak here. And we're going to end the, the podcast with you getting to look at lots and lots of photographs of the podcast. We did the, abandon them the for cats. a lot of the year. And now. we had a lot of difficulties. And we had to, you know, we had to, we had a big challenge. We were looking up books and things about what to do about your cats who feel that they, you were, that they were abandoned. Because they were And they abandoned. were starting to love other people. And I have to report, and it's a very good, and you'll see these photographs at the end, that in fairness... And I, I feel like it's almost the hand of God. The hat, cats have come back and are very, very affectionate and being loving and kind and nice to us, which is nice because it was a little bit scary when we came back, particularly from Israel, to see the cats kind of snubbing us for a while. Oh, wow. But they have forgiven us. So happy new year to you for 2024. And see you next week. See you next year. Bye.